Hey guys, what's going on? This is Brennan Vermeyer here today with Functional Diagnostic Nutrition for a very special webinar that I'm very excited to put on for all of you guys. So we have a pretty healthy crowd, uh, a lot of registrants and a healthy crowd listening live. Uh, about 500 people actually signed up to register for this event. So that's super cool, super flattering, and also amazing because quite frankly the information that we're going to be diving into today really is nothing short of life-changing i know this from experience with working with hundreds of clients mentoring hundreds of professionals that go through our certification program clinical consulting with hundreds of practitioners that are graduates of our program uh, so i've seen this material in action time and time again and again it's really nothing short of magical so thank you guys so much for tuning in Happy to have you here. This is going to be a pretty uh, jam-packed nerd session on some great metabolic science. So we did a quick refresher. I don't know if any of you guys were tuned into the part one. This is kind of part two of a little bit of a series that we did with this webinar here. So part one we did about two months ago, and I'll be touching on refreshing you guys on some of what we discussed there. But part one was very much focused on a deep dive into the hormonal dysregulation that can occur due to chronic stress. Today, we're gonna take that a level deeper and get into what are the underlying causes of that endocrine dysregulation. I'll explain further, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. So, let's go and dive in here though. Uh, plenty to cover, we might go a little bit over an hour, just heads up, uh, but there will be a replay that we're gonna send out. So, hormone imbalance, hidden sources of stress that cause them. We're gonna dive deep into all of that. So, let's go and get started. Who's that guy? I don't know. I guess that guy's me. That's why I have my, my webcam on so you guys can, uh, you know, know that I'm a real person. I'm a real dude. So, who is that guy? Uh, well, that guy is me, Brennan Vermeyer. I am the director of the Association of Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioners. Whew. That is a mouthful, so uh, I just like to say I'm the director of the AFDNP. That is our professional association of functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners. So basically, our we you know we are an association of pros. We do this professionally. This is our full time. We change lives on the regular, and it's amazing. Uh, so I do have seven years of uh, experience within the health and fitness industry. I started personal training and nutrition coaching was 19 years old and basically it was always my uh, mission and, and goal to be the guy that had all the answers. You know, like if a client wasn't getting the results they wanted with their health and or fitness, I wanted to know why. I wanted to be the guy that had those answers. And so I've just evolved over time uh, to the point where, yeah, now I, you know, I train professionals as they go through the Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Program and then when they graduate, I do clinical consulting, uh, which is basically like if we have a practitioner who they run a lab test, uh, they have a complex case with a client and maybe they need a little bit of professional guidance. That's where we come in as clinical advisors to guide them on, okay, well, here's what the data means. Here's what I would suggest you look into. Here's some strategies you could implement with the client. Uh, but it's amazing. I work full time for FDN and then I have my private practice um, outside of that where I work with clients privately. Uh, but yeah, I do have a lot of different credentials, uh, you know, everything from personal training, m a lot of different nutrition certifications. I'm even a CrossFit trainer, although I don't coach right now because this is, this is my full time. This is what I love. But basically, I'm a professional nerd, a uh, professional muscle nerd, if you will. You know, so the best of functional fitness and functional nutrition. So, so I want to refresh your guys' memory a little bit on basically why FDN is so necessary and so, uh, well, really in such high demand in modern society. So when we look at society's top killers, you know, I did borrow a few slides from part one of this webinar series, and this is one of them. But society's top killers, you know, what are the conditions and diseases that are costing healthcare billions of dollars every year, which only puts our you know, nation in more debt. I'm not really an economical guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a natural science guy, so I don't get into all the politics of health, but 
you know, it is kind of undeniable when we look at, you know, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative disease, stroke, suicide, metabolic syndrome, you know, all of these things. Our society is not being plagued by rare malignant diseases that need some fancy drug to fix the problem. You know, what is really destroying our society, costing healthcare billions of dollars, yada, 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 lifestyle induced conditions and diseases. So I have no problem with drugs and surgery when they're appropriate. Let me say that like once and then we can be done with it and move on. I don't have anything against the technology of pharmaceuticals and surgery. There's a time and a place that is, you know, that safety net for when we really need it, you know, to prevent really bad things. The problem is our healthcare system is trying to medicate our way out of what is a lifestyle epidemic, a environmental and environmental and lifestyle epidemic. We simply can't medicate our way out of lifestyle induced chronic disease. So let's go. Uh, so I'll briefly touch on this just so again, you know, you guys kind of understand if you're very much in tune with the uh, functional practitioner world, you already know this, uh, or maybe you're not overly familiar with it. So I came up with what I call the healthcare spectrum. So on the right side, now I, you know, I, I joke a little bit. I don't like to take life too seriously. I like to have fun. So over on the right side, we have, uh, you know, this kind of funny little joke about like, all right, but that's disease care, right? That is conventional medicine. It's disease care. It's you know, treating an ill with a pill, if you will, right? So, wow, that, ill with a pill. Anyways, but you know, it's all about like, what drug can we give you to suppress symptoms or manage a condition? Uh, do we need to cut something out of your body? And there really no, there there are no other solutions that doctors are providing. And again, you know, is that wrong or right? I don't know. It is what it is. So we need to recognize that. Hey, we need more than that. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, again, my background is personal training, nutrition coaching. That's really how I got started, uh, although I very quickly got into this. But, you know, there's more like the fitness side of it, you know, so generic uh, health coaching, generic nutrition, consulting, fitness coaching, um, kind of a lot of bro science. Honestly, I, I joke about that. Uh, but, you know, weights and protein shakes, more cardio, less carbs and, you know, losing weight equals getting healthier, which is not true. Uh, so anyways, that's one side. That's one side. But as we can see, there's a huge gap between those two things. We need a lot more. We need a very well educated professional that understands human metabolism on a very intricate and in-depth level. We need somebody that can use functional lab testing to identify healing opportunities and metabolic disturbances. So rather than, you know, using all these words and whatever, here's a good example that really il illustrates that point. I think just about everybody here in attendance has probably heard of adrenal fatigue, right? Or really HP axis dysfunction, but like adrenal fatigue, um, most medical doctors would look at adrenal fatigue and say that pseudoscience that doesn't exist has nothing to do with your health. Now, here's what's a little bit ironic about that. So if we consider Cushing syndrome or Cushing's disease, if it progresses, or then Addison's disease. So Addison's disease is your adrenal glands are not producing like any cortisol. So if you, you know, look at a, a cortisol test, saliva, urine, you're going to see like flatline cortisol, like very, very, very low cortisol. And that sucks to have. Uh, now, on the flip side of that, then you have Cushing syndrome, which is very elevated cortisol like flatlined, way too high, very elevated cortisol, which is not good. We need just right. We need Goldilocks effect right in the middle. Adrenal fatigue or HP axis dysfunction, which is the more accurate term, is somewhere in the middle. And so it's it, it really just doesn't even make sense conceptually how a, a doctor could say, there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue and that that's pseudoscience, that doesn't exist. It's so absolute, it's all or nothing. Well, if it's not extremely high or extremely low, then it has nothing to do with your symptoms, your health complaints, how you feel. And it's like that that's not at all true. We know like I mean, we can prove it with objective data with our lab testing. You know, I've run hundreds of adrenal panels on my clients and I can tell you, yes, it's very real. Like if somebody has slightly elevated cortisol, slightly depressed, or maybe it's a roller coaster throughout the day, 
it has a very direct impact on their symptoms and health complaints and how they feel, how they perform, cognition, blah, 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 you know, so on and so forth. So anyways, um, this is where functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners live. We own this bridge. We dominate this bridge. Quite frankly, we produce some of the best functional practitioners in the world. Uh, sometimes I find that people, professionals with more of like a medical background, sometimes they have a hard time really, not always, I'm not trying to make any like generalized statements. I, it's just a trend that I see where sometimes they have a hard time really working functionally and holistically because there's so much in this allopathic mindset. So sometimes what I see is like functional medicine practitioners who they might be a licensed physician that is trying to get into the functional approach, the functional way of dealing with metabolic dysfunction. Sometimes what they end up doing is, well, they run functional testing, but then they treat the test results using natural supplements. And they're like, well, I'm, I'm running functional testing. I'm using natural, you know, herbal nutraceutical, you know, supplements. So that's functional medicine. It's like, well, that's not the functional way. The functional way is using the lab testing to gain objective insight into the client's current state of physiology and biochemistry, correlating that with the health journey that this person is on, correlating with the person in front of you. You don't treat the piece of paper. You know, you're treating the person, right? You're, you're treating the person's metabolism non-specifically. We don't want to just treat the test results, take it at face value, here's your supplements. It needs to be a holistic lifestyle approach combined with you know supplement protocols and whatnot so the the true functional way is all about critical thinking skills it's like being a health detective so sometimes i think uh you know medical people they they just have a hard time learning how to change the way they think about the human metabolism it's very piece of paper here's your pill and there's no quick fixes for this stuff it really takes that holistic lifestyle approach Okay, so we're going to fly through some of these next slides, but I do need to either refresh your memory if you did attend my last webinar or just catch you up a little bit. Um, so what is metabolic dysfunction? Now, in uh, functional diagnostic nutrition, we have a term that we call metabolic chaos. That is a trademark term that only FDN practitioners have legal rights to use. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm saying metabolic dysfunction. But either way, metabolic chaos, metabolic dysfunction, it's an umbrella term that we use to denote any time there's dysfunction or imbalance within the body's major metabolic systems. Now, that could be something more microscopic, like a specific biochemical imbalance, like elevated homocysteine, which can relate to like methylation, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, I don't want to get too, I don't want to go off into these tangents on some of my favorite subjects. Or it could be something a little bit more macro, like, oh, this person doesn't have a gallbladder, therefore they're not able to properly transport bile for detox or uh, digestion. So an umbrella term. Now, here's kind of a good illustration. Uh, again, if we want to really illustrate that paradigm shift of more like the conventional allopathic approach to disease versus the functional underlying root cause approach. So, you know, obviously, <clears throat> whereas let's say you're insulin resistant, uh, potentially pre-diabetic or maybe type 2 diabetic, somewhere within that insulin resistance spectrum. Okay, you go to your doctor, you know, blood sugar is way too high at like 126. Uh, and so, boom, here's your prescription for metformin. Maybe you should lose some weight too. Maybe you should exercise, uh, if they even say that. But here's your metformin. You're on your way to the pharmacy. And that's it, period. Like, that's your treatment plan. Okay, well, the functional approach to insulin resistance is gonna be considering every factor of their lifestyle. What's going on with your nutrition, your rest, your exercise, your stress management and reduction, environmental toxins, giving supplementation to expedite certain pathways, right? You know, let's use some insulin sensitizing agents. Are you, you know, nutrient deficient in the nutrients you need to properly transport and utilize glucose in the first place? So quite frankly, it is a much, more, like to say that it's much more thorough is a drastic understatement. You know, we strive to, to really understand, uh, like basically the way I like to describe the functional approach is we are trying to understand how does this system work on a very intricate and detailed level. 
And then we're trying to understand what factors will negatively impact the function of this system. Therefore, what can we do holistically to remove all of the things that are negatively impacting the system and give the system what it needs to function properly? And so there's a lot of science too, it's very in depth. So we're working on the underlying causes. You know, that's the biggest thing. Like for example, you know, I have so many guys that come to me, hey, Brennan, I think I have low testosterone. Can we check my testosterone? Okay, my testosterone's low, so what do we do to fix my testosterone? And it's like, you're not asking the question, you're not asking the right question. You're not looking at it the right way. We need to be thinking about why. Why is your testosterone low? Or if you're insulin resistant, why are you insulin resistant? You know, let's not just give a drug and send them on their way. Why is this happening? What factors are contributing to the progression of this dysfunction? That's the level we need to work at if we really want to get our clients to optimal health. You know, a drug might be able to manage a condition a little bit. It's not going to give them the quality of health or life they deserve. Yeah, you know, that's why I chose to not go to medical school. My parents, you know, my, my dad is very, uh, his, his father, my grandfather, was a orthopedic surgeon, you know, so yes, I, I have some doctors in the family. There is that medical. Uh, they would have loved for me to go to medical school. And I was like, no, I'm going to make my life way harder, <laughs> you know, and um, it's all worked out now. But man, whew, it was quite the road to get to where I'm at. Uh, but nonetheless, that's why I didn't want like that's not what I wanted. I didn't want to give sick people drugs. I wanted to actually get people to the vibrant health and quality of life they deserve. That's it. Okay, so symptoms are a manifestation of underlying dysfunction. So everybody has some symptoms. They can be mild, moderate, severe, frequent, infrequent. Uh, but nonetheless, symptoms are basically your body's way of telling you something's going wrong. There is an underlying cause. Now, the thing is, symptoms can be very far removed from the actual underlying dysfunction. So for example, one of my favorite subjects is neurotransmitters. I love neurochemistry because my health issues were very much related to like cognitive, mental health, neurochemistry, all of that. However, if you have gut issues, you have gut dysfunction, whether you know it's maldigestion, nutrient deficiencies, parasites, we'll get into some of that later. But if you have issues in your gut, that might be causing the issues in your brain. So, oh, okay, let's fix your neurotransmitters. Let me give you, you know, 5-HTP to boost your serotonin, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? You're not fixing the underlying problem. You know, I see this all the time. So you have to get to that root cause level. And there's going to be a lot of root causes. So again, okay, very briefly, yin yang of health. So here's the thing. Basically, in a nutshell, you can read the slide. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading it for you. I like to think about our health as like a yin yang of physiology, psychology, and they fit together. So the psychology, your mental outlook, your mental attitude, which you do choose to some degree, uh, that has a very direct impact on your physiology. For example, if you allow yourself to get caught up in negativity or anxiety, or you're you know, worrying about something a lot, that's going to evoke a, a biochemical stress response that will very directly impact your other physiological systems. And we're going to get into that. But similarly, it's the other way around, right? Your psychology is very much impacted by your physiology. Me, for example, with like some of my issues in the past with depression, ADD, so on and so forth. Um, I might talk about that more. We'll see. But like with that kind of stuff, okay, well, even if I do all the positive, you know, attitude strategies in the world and, you know, just think positive, Brennan, like just choose to have a good attitude. Well, guess what? If my serotonin is in the tank or my hormones are imbalanced or if I have gut issues, I'm fighting an uphill battle. So that's why we have to address both. You have to address the mental game, but you have to address the metabolic game. Mental metabolic game. I've never used, I like that. I'm going to have to write that down. All right. So what causes metabolic dysfunction? You know, that is the next logical question. What causes your metabolic systems to go haywire or get a little bit funky or imbalanced or whatever? So I tried to think of a lot of different um, factors and we're going to be diving into these factors, but our health is essentially dictated by the sum of the following genetic, epigenetic, environmental factors. Um, toxin and, and detox capacity psychology. I'm not going to read the whole list, but you guys kind of get the point. So I was trying to think of as many factors that have an influence on your metabolic health and therefore what might be causing your metabolic systems to go haywire. Okay, so really though, what causes your metabolism to get jacked up? 
stress. That's the short answer. However, obviously a lot of people, when they hear the word stress, they're just thinking of mental emotional. I know I'm talking a little bit fast. We have a lot to cover and this was all presented in part one. So I'm trying to really just do a quick recap so we can move on. But we have to be thinking about what is stress as perceived and experienced by the human metabolism. How does your hypothalamus register a stressor, right? So that's where I came up with my own nerdy definition. Feel free to borrow it. <laughs> you can cite me, hashtag BV. Um, but stress is the body's necessity for mental acuity and physical work capacity, AKA stress is like doing work. You know, anything that requires the body to expend energy and utilize bodily resources to accomplish a mental or physical task, that is technically like a stressor. That is a burden on the body. So I just like to think of it more in like analogies. Analogies are always helpful. So if you think about your car, okay, driving the car, you're doing work. You're, you're burning gas. You're wearing out the tires. You're using oil. I'm not an auto person. I don't know anything about cars. Uh, whereas obviously you take the car in for maintenance, take it in the shop, rotate the tires, change the oil, fill up the gas tank. So I like to think about our health as really a balance between those two things. And the reality is most people take better care of their cars than they do their body. So yeah, all right, let's keep going. Very briefly touch on this. Again, a little bit of a review here. So the autonomic nerve system, obviously that is the branch of the nervous system that regulates all the stuff we don't have to think about. We, I don't have to think about pumping my heart right now. I don't have to think about digesting my food. I don't have to uh, you know, consciously produce white blood cells. My body just does this stuff. And that is all regulated by the autonomic nerve system. Now. Within the autonomic nerve system, we have the two sides of that. We have sympathetic, you know, fight or flight is the tagline, and then parasympathetic, rest and digest, feed and breathe, that is the tagline. Now, I think the taglines are cute to help, you know, you remember, obviously, you got a caveman running from a saber-toothed tiger, and then this dude's chilling and, you know, slightly comatose, uh, you know, got tripped to fan, right, that Thanksgiving saying, pretty funny. But as you can see here, I kind of clarified using bodily resources to accomplish a mental or physical task. That is sympathetic activity. Parasympathetic activity is restoring bodily resources and protecting the body from, you know, foreign invaders and pathogens and all of that. So when you're in a state of sympathetic activity, it's all about breaking down, you know, nutrient to, for nutrient availability for energy production. It's stimulating. It gives you that burst of get up and go energy so you can accomplish a mental or physical task. Now, there's the immediate stress response. Like if I like, OK, in my stairwell, there's all these spiders. I hate spiders and I have to like dodge under them like Neo in the Matrix uh, to get by them in the morning and go to the gym. Pretty much the only time I leave my humble abode. Um, but you know, it's like, oh, a spider, you know, adrenaline response, right? So adrenaline is the immediate stress response, like an immediate stressor, right? You almost get hit by a car or whatever. But cortisol is more like your day-to-day -day stress response. And we'll get into that. Whereas parasympathetic activity, okay, digestion, immune function, uh, building up tissues, restoring the body. So really just think about this is driving your car. It's using your car. It's putting miles on the car. It's wearing the car out. This is the opposite. This is giving your car maintenance. And really, vibrant health is when we're going to be in homeostasis. We have a perfect balance. So as you can see, I made this little teeter-totter. So, you know, if you have adequate parasympathetic activity versus sympathetic, you're going to have probably good homeostasis. And the problem is humans, especially in the 21st century, our lifestyle has never been more physiologically stressful. We've never lived such a high speed, stimulating and physiologically stressful. Our environment is more toxic than ever. We live a very high speed, stimulating, you know, stressful. That's the way it works. All right. Okay, the almighty HP axis. The HP axis is what regulates the stress response, the biochemical stress response. And we're gonna be getting into what triggers the stress response today. Part one was all about what happens hormonally when the stress response has been initiated. Part two, which is today, what caused the stress response in the first place? So we have the region of the brain, hypothalamus, it's always getting input signals. Okay, what's going on in the environment, both internal and external, what's going on? What do we need to do to self-regulate and maintain homeostatic mechanisms, maintain homeostatic efficiency in order to maintain balance? You know, the body is always trying to do as much work as possible 
while minimizing energy expenditure. That's a survival mechanism. That's what has allowed us to evolve, right? If we're not energy efficient, you know, we die. We are, our species uh, can't continue. It's survival of the fittest. It's survival of the most, uh, you know, metabolically efficient, if you will. And there's, uh, you know, there's other stuff I could get into with that. So anyways, we see some different functions of the hormone cortisol. So when the hypothalamus registers input signals that are like, hey, there is mental or physical work that needs to be done. Okay, well, then you get this signal through CRH to the anterior pituitary gland, then that secretes ACTH down to the adrenal gland, sit on top of the kidneys, and then boom, we secrete cortisol uh, from the adrenal glands. And so then cortisol does all these wonderful things. Now, really, though, you can, le uh, you can read the list of specific mechanisms over here, but really, though, cortisol is your stress response hormone. You hear people say it's your stress hormone all the time. I think that's misleading. Calling it a stress hormone, that's misleading. It makes it sound like a bad thing. It's a stress response hormone. It's giving you the burst of fight or flight energy to accomplish a mental or physical task. Whether that is, you know, you got fired from your job and now you're really stressed out because you need to find a new one, or you have rampant inflammation in the body. So now your body has to use energy to combat and subdue that inflammation. Um, it, it really could be a lot of things there. It could even, uh, that was what I was gonna say, something more simple, it wakes you up in the morning. It's a diurnal circadian rhythm regulating hormone. Cortisol is literally the hormone that wakes you up and then it gives you that cortisol awakening response which gives you that burst of fight or flight energy to start your day. That's why cortisol starts high in the morning or it should and then it gradually drops off throughout the day. You know, And then it's lowest at night, melatonin goes up so then you can fall asleep, rinse and repeat. Okay. Here we go. Uh, yeah, whew, fly through this. Okay, so this is what we got into in part one and then all the subsequent hormone imbalances uh, that result from this. But basically, when we're healthy, we're happy, our metabolism. Don't think about this as you, as in your own psyche. Think about this as your, your metabolism, your physiology. When your metabolism is not excessively stressed out, you're, you're healthy, you're happy, you're in, you know, you're in homeostasis. You have proper cortisol levels, you know, which I never really see this until I fix it with my client. Um, usually people's cortisol is all over the place. But you have adequate cortisol, you have healthy baseline. So the x-axis is progression over time. The y-axis is the total amount of cortisol your adrenal glands are producing, secreting in a given time frame, 24 hours. So when we're healthy, we're happy, we're in the green box, we have adequate cortisol levels now. When the metabolism detects sources of stress, which we're going to talk about in a second, okay, well, hey, we need more cortisol because we have more mental and physical work to do. So then we go up into what we call phase one or the acute phase of HP axis dysfunction. So our body is literally producing more cortisol to give us more of that energy to overcome the challenge. Now, the idea is once we resolve and we remove the source of stress or sources of stress, well, then theoretically, we should go back down to the green box. We go back down to being healthy and happy. That's the way the body's designed to work. We, we go up when we need to go up, and then we go back to normal. The problem is most people are so chronically stressed out or their metabolisms are so chronically stressed out due to poor lifestyle habits, a toxic environment, a very stimulating and demanding you know, schedule and, and societal pace of life on top of other sources of stress that we're going to talk about in a second. And this really just, it burdens the system, it's too much. Quite frankly, you're driving your car too much and you're not giving it the rest and maintenance it needs to stay healthy. Your body can't, you're not the energizer bunny. You can't just go forever and ever, you know? It's not how it works. And if you don't give your body what it needs to maintain health, it will start collapsing. So then those cortisol levels, as that system starts to collapse, you'll drop down into the compensatory phase or stage two where basically your body's still trying to keep up with the demands that you're placing on the system, but it's starting to fail. And then if that continues long enough, boom, cortisol levels just completely plummet, drop down, and that's what we call the exhaustive phase. And this is really where you know most people would say like, quote unquote, I have adrenal fatigue, help me. Uh, so now this is just cortisol though. Keep in mind though, cortisol is gonna have a very direct impact on other physiological systems. So for example, High levels of cortisol directly inhibit thyroid function. High levels of cortisol directly inhibit thyroid stimulating hormone 
and inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the bioactive thyroid hormone. That's just the thyroid, but then also it's inhibiting immune function as well as uh, digestive function. So that's the thing is there's a lot of other systems. It's like a domino effect, a domino cascade of dysfunction and ultimately disease if left um, unchecked. But that's the thing, there's a lot of other systems that are gonna be negatively impacted. That's why we work holistically. We don't just go, okay, so um, I think the problem is cortisol, so uh, let's measure your cortisol, and then what can I do to fix your cortisol? No, we have to work on the whole thing, because all of the systems are gonna be impacted. But also, what triggered this in the first place? You can't spot treat any one thing, you have to do all of it. That's why we get people such amazing results. So this is kind of what I was getting at. So, you know, basically just fix the hormones? No, the way, so again, to reiterate, because if we have time, I don't think we will, but if we have time, I'll show you some of my other slides that I left at the end from part one of the webinar series, because in part one, I dove into, okay, so after cortisol and the HPA axis is triggered, what other hormone imbalances result? you know, thyroid issues, neurotransmitter issues, sex hormone issues like low testosterone, all that good stuff. But here's what it comes down to. The way that I teach my students, AKA professionals that go through our certification course, I call them my students. Um, the way that I teach my students to think about the endocrine system and hormone balance is kind of like the check engine light on your car. So what I mean is when the check engine light comes on, the problem is not that the light is on. The problem is what that light represents. And what does that light represent? Well, it means that there's something under the hood that's not working properly, and that's what triggered the light to come on in the first place. So there's a lot more awareness about hormone health and hormone balance these days. It's kind of like a hot topic, and you see just tons of information um, you know, circulating through the internet and social media about hormones, hormones, hormones. And then you get all these peddlers that are just super eager to you know, let me run a hormone test and I'll fix your hormones. I'll put you on hormone replacement therapy, blah, blah, blah. It's spot treating. They're not asking the right question. They're not approaching it from a, a effective approach of why do you have hormone imbalances? So no, you can't just fix the hormones. The hormones are just the check engine light. Everybody has hormone imbalances, but then it's a matter of what messed up your hormones, a crappy lifestyle, or are there hidden sources of stress that are causing the hormone imbalance, which is the name of this presentation. Woo! All right, so now that I set the stage <laughs> with like a 30 minute rant, now you guys are prepared and ready to receive some magical information. So yes, I do hormone testing on all of my clients. And yes, there are hormone modulation protocols that we can use to expedite the hormone balancing process. However, if all you're doing is running hormone testing and trying to fix the hormones with hormone modulation protocols, you're not gonna be successful. I see this all the time, especially like the guys that are, my testosterone's low, so, you know, I'm gonna take it, I just had this happen this week, you know, so I'm gonna take a testosterone boost, boosting supplement. And it's like that little supplement is not going to overpower the dysfunction going on in your metabolism, AKA the bad juju going on under the car hood. So you gotta take it to the auto mechanics, Jiffy Lube, um, <laughs> and uh, you know get that investigated and fixed. Okay, here we go. So what sources of stress cause the stress response in the first place, and then subsequently hormone imbalances, thyroid issues, neurotransmitter imbalances, sex hormones, cortisol, adrenal thyroid gonad, right? The oat axis, um, ovarian adrenal thyroid, or really the gonad adrenal thyroid axis, AKA the whole endocrine system, okay? Let's keep it easy. So this is one of the most, I don't know why I'm, I'm moving my hands and, and the mouse, I'm just all over the place, but this is one of the most important things that you guys need to understand. So when we're talking about sources of stress, there are three categories of stress that your hypothalamus is going to perceive as a threat to your health and your survival, therefore. So obviously when we say stress, most people are just thinking about psych psychological, emotional. Now, yes, that is a, that, that's one of the three categories, guys. That is a very real category. So yes, all of that emotional, psychological stress, that could very well be a major part 
of your health issues. Okay, so then category two, biomechanical structural. Oh, I have a herniated disc in my low back. I have scoliosis. I have a sprained ankle. I have a torn Achilles tendon or something more mild. Like actually I did a really hard leg workout yesterday. My legs are really sore. Why? Because I damaged my muscles on a cellular level. I damaged them. They are, they are broken. They are damaged. And that's going to evoke an inflammatory response as my body now has to work hard to try to heal those muscles and connective tissue. So it doesn't have to be extreme, but the way you have to be thinking about it is every little thing that is a burden on the body, every little source of stress, it's just, it's another brick. It's another brick on the teeter-totter. And it's going to create an imbalance in that teeter-totter, which leads to dysfunction and ultimately disease. So that's kind of how you have to be thinking about your health. What is burdening your body? What's making it work hard? And is it getting enough of what it needs to keep up with the demands you're, you're placing on it? My legs recovering from that workout, it means I need more sleep. I need more food. I need more rest. And if I'm just go, 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 I'm wearing out my body. I'm wearing out my systems. Okay. Here we go, biochemical physiological stressors or what we in FDN land like to call hidden stressors, hidden sources of stress and how they cause hormone imbalance. That is what we're here for. So this is what FDN practitioners and functional practitioners specialize in identifying with functional lab testing and addressing with functional healing protocols, okay? This is what we specialize in, however, even though this is what we do, we recognize the bigger picture. So that's the thing. You know, we're going to recognize, hey, your check engine light is on. So whereas maybe we specialize in the hidden stressors, we're also going to be screening our clients for, hey, do you have structural issues that are contributing to the stress response? Do you have psychological, emotional stress that's contributing? So I'm not a psychologist. Now, I feel like one sometimes with how much I deal with my clients' emotions. Um, I am a personal trainer. I am a corrective exercise specialist, but I don't, I don't do any fitness coaching anymore. Um, so if I have a client that does have structural issues, I'm going to refer them out to like a, a physiotherapist, maybe a chiropractor, but more so, you know, like corrective exercise and, and getting everything realigned, blah, blah, blah. Um, likewise, if I have a client that, you know, really has some serious emotional issues that go beyond, you know, what my empathetic you know, coaching skills can handle, you know, maybe you need to go work with a counselor or a therapist, whatever. Because the whole point, I understand that all of these factors are going to negatively impact their metabolic health. So if there's something that I can't handle, it still has to be dealt with. But this is what we're here to talk about today, the hidden stressors. So that's the thing. Everybody knows about this and everybody knows about this. You know, who doesn't go to a chiropractor these days? I mean, I don't, but yeah, you know, it seems like a lot of people do, right? Get get my adjustment and I feel better. And it's like, well, still got to fix the muscles though too. Um, and then the psychological, emotional. But this is what people don't know about. And conventional medicine ignores like everything we're going to talk about today. So that's why functional practitioners, uh, probably one of the most, uh, you know, secure jobs you could go into. We are in very high demand. It's the future of healthcare. Times are changing. Um, some serious job security uh, with, you know, lifestyle induced disease at an all time high. So here we go. We're going to dive into all sorts of stressors. Now, with that said, before I move the slide, we're about to cover a lot of topics. Every single one of these topics is very complex, very in depth. We don't have time to discuss the details. I just want to present the concept, present the idea. Uh, I've gone through hundreds of hours of clinical education on, you know, each of these subjects. So you know, this can be a, an overview to say the least. Okay, I did try to order these kind of in a hierarchy order. There's a reason I ordered it the way I did. So let's get going. Step one, digestive disturbance, pretty simple. If you have digestive disturbance, health begins in the gut. I don't care what the issue is, uh, autoimmune thyroid issue, uh, hormone imbalances, uh, heavy metal toxicity, whatever, health starts in the gut. Every client is a gut case at the end of the day. So we have to be looking at their gut health. So digestive disturbance, guys, we all know that nutrition is absolutely crucial, but 
obviously you're only as healthy as what you can properly digest, absorb, and assimilate. So if you have digestive disturbances like hypochlorhydria, which is low stomach acid, or pancreatic insufficiency, like low pancreatic enzyme output, or you know, a biliary stasis, an issue with your bile, you're not gonna be able to properly digest uh, your food to then be able to absorb it and reap the benefits of those nutrients. So literally, I mean, digestion is like step one to your health. So, you know, some different uh, testing that we can do for looking, these are just a couple examples of different biomarkers that we look at uh, through lab testing to assess for digestion, such as urinary indican. So this is uh, very compromised digestion right here, uh, or this is a different lab test that shows elastase is low, which is pancreatic insufficiency, basically, not enough pancreatic enzymes. Uh, or then steatocrit is like fecal fat. So we can see this person is not digesting and absorbing their fat very well. So, you know, both of these are good examples of compromised digestion. So digestion can be compromised by a lot of things, like uh, especially, I don't think I even listed medications, but how many people are on, you know, antacids or proton pump inhibitors and uh, all that kind of stuff, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, Advil, Tylenol, you know, a lot of these things have a very direct impact on, on digestion, but adrenal thyroid issues, low stomach acid, microbial imbalances, inflammation, nutrient deficiencies, food sensitivities. All right, moving on. Food sensitivities. Um, so food sensitivities is a very popular subject, but also very misunderstood. Uh, so food sensitivities or food intolerances, that can mean a lot of things. There's a lot of different types of food sensitivity testing. Quite frankly, not all of them are very helpful. And Unfortunately, the ones that I see marketed all the time, they'll you know, do your at-home test and it tells you what not to eat. Um, a lot of those ones actually are, are not the technology that we need to really get useful information out of it. People are like, oh, it's weird. Like I did this food sensitivity test and it said I'm sensitive to everything that I eat. And it's like, well, that's because all it's really doing is measuring the antibody production to what you eat regularly. It doesn't really mean that you're like overly sensitive to it. It's just that's what you're immune system is being exposed to time and time again. So this is a snapshot of the uh, mediator release test from Oxford Biomedical, which is kind of our go-to food sensitivity test. Now keep in mind, food sensitivities are highly individualized. So food sensitivities, we're really talking about what food antigens promote, uh, provoke a inflammatory response in the body. And I'll tell you right now, inflammation and oxidative stress are the two main plagues of the human metabolism, period. So inflammation, anything that we can do to reduce inflammation is crucial, crucial for the healing process. So basically anything that's promoting inflammation, we're going to consider like a food sensitivity or intolerance. Now a food sensitivity, that is different than you can't digest something, right? So like lactose intolerance, that's a, a lactose intolerance because you can't digest the lactose and it's upsetting your tummy. A food sensitivity is something like, let's say you're reactive to uh, dairy. I don't know, uh, here we are. Uh, so dairy right here, right? We see goat's milk, yogurt, cow's milk, cheddar cheese, whatever. Okay, this is not, you can't digest it. This is saying, hey, when your white blood cells are exposed to dairy antigens, dairy particles, it promotes mediator release, which mediators are causing, they are literally triggering inflammation. So you have to think about what your immune system is doing in response to food versus can you digest it or is it messing up your gut bacteria? So food intolerances, food sensitivities, there's different mechanisms at play and you have to understand the difference between you can't digest it or it's uh, you know causing a bad reaction with your gut bacteria or it's triggering an inflammatory response through the immune system, different things. Okay, GI pathogens and microbial imbalances. This is, boom, Whew. this is one of the biggest hidden stressors that we deal with as functional practitioners. Huge, huge. That's why it's so early in the presentation. Um, so when I'm talking about GI pathogens, I'm talking about microscopic organisms that might be hiding out in your gut. Now, obviously, yes, we have, we literally have more bacterial cells in our gastrointestinal tract, then we have body cells, human body cells, cells of our body, right? So the human body is made up of approximately 100 trillion cells. We have a lot more bacterial cells in our gut than um, we have cells making up our body. 
Most of those bacteria are going to be in the large intestine. They are in the small intestine too. Uh, so there's bacteria that are supposed to be there and there's bacteria that are not supposed to be there. But it's not just bacteria. There's also parasites, literally microscopic bugs that are not supposed to be there. It's part of life. It's kind of funny how everybody that has a dog, they know to uh, look out for like, does my dog have worms or anything like that? But then humans kind of think that doesn't apply to us. Um, but then you hear horror stories of somebody like, oh, I picked up a tapeworm eating sushi. These are very real things. So two different stool tests um, showing here. We have one over here, cryptosporidium, that, that's a microscopic bug that can cause a lot of inflammation and gut damage, compromised digestion, trigger autoimmunity, blah, 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 blah. Uh, over here, we have a different type of stool test looking at, we have blastocystis hominis, cyclospora. Uh, both of those are microscopic parasites or bugs. Uh, that can cause a lot of issues and damage. And then we also see some fungal overgrowth. So when we, you know, I don't want to get too caught up on any one subject, but when we're talking about GI pathogens and microbe imbalances, we're talking about parasites, we're talking about worms, we're talking about fungus, and we're talking about bacteria. And we're also kind of talking about viruses too. So all of these things, you know, these are their own organisms, microscopic organisms that are going to have a very direct impact on our health. Um, and sadly, I don't know why. I don't, I don't for the life of me know why. Uh, but conventional medicine basically ignores all of this and turns a blind eye to it. Makes no sense. Okay, um, next up, leaky gut or intestinal hyperpermeability, which is generally going to be caused by the aforementioned hidden stressors. So leaky gut is kind of a hot topic these days, and for good reason, it's extremely important. Uh, so intestinal hyperpermeability. We don't have time to, I don't have time to like teach you exactly what it is, but it's basically when your intestines are hyperpermeable and things that are not supposed to go from the gut into circulation are now able to. It's kind of like if you're trying to get into the nightclub, right? There's a bouncer. The bouncer is, okay, you're on the list. You get into the club. Oh, you're not on the list. Go away. Okay, well, what happens if there's no bouncer? Anybody can get in. That's not a good thing. The intestinal lining has to selectively absorb nutrients transcellularly, but at the same time, keep out the bad guys. So keep out undigested food particles that will evoke inflammation. Keep out um, bacteria, keep out parasites, keep out toxins, right? I always think about like when you go out to the lake, you know, um, I'm in the Midwest. So like, you know, if you ever go to the lake, the Ozarks, and you know, if you swallow some lake water, think about how much nasty stuff is in that lake water. If we didn't have an intestinal lining and mucosal barrier, uh, and we just absorbed everything that's in that lake water, pretty sure you would die like instantly, you know? Uh, so the gut actually plays that role of, you know, let's absorb nutrients that we need and keep out the bad stuff. If you have leaky gut, that's all going haywire. In leaky gut, I'll just kind of get to the point, leaky gut is one of the primary mechanisms that initiates autoimmune conditions. We don't have time to get into the mechanisms, but I'll teach you if you become a student of mine. SIBO uh, and SIFO, small intestinal bacterial or fungal overgrowth. SIBO and SIFO. Uh, so this is a little bit kind of later on. Again, there's, there's an order that I'm presenting this with uh, in a logical manner. So if you have bacterial overgrowth in a place, you know, it's basically normal bacteria that are too abundant in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, there's a lot of, it's a beautiful synchrony uh, that goes on as food is moving through the small intestine and then the large intestine, the digestive and absorptive processes that are going on. It's a beautifully synchronized uh, process, but only if it's working properly. And if it goes high, uh, if it gets hijacked, it's no good. Bad things can happen. So SIBO and SIFO are very common where you can develop overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine um, or overgrowth of fungal uh, fungus in the small intestine. And that can be a, cause a lot of bad things. So like IBS, for example, now irritable bowel syndrome, how can, how can that actually be a diagnosis? I don't get it. Your bowels are irritable. Well, I already knew that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I know my intestines are pissed off. So why are they pissed off? Well, I don't know, but you're, they, they are. And it's like, okay, that was helpful. Um, so it has been documented that about 84% of cases of IBS 
is the result of SIBO. So really, anytime I hear IBS, gas and bloating, uh, chronic fatigue, joint pain, even like infertility, can all be traced back to bacterial overgrowth in the intestines. It's it's crazy. And again, we don't have time to get into all the mechanisms, but this is an example of a SIBO breath test where we're measuring gas production as uh, the sugar molecules are being uh, fermented by your gut bacteria. And so as those sugar molecules that you drink for the test are moving through your intestines, okay, well, if you have a lot of overgrowth of bacteria high up in the small intestine, boom, we're gonna be able to measure that gas reading at different 20 minute increments. Uh, and then of course, when it hits large intestine, that's when you should see the gas levels go up because the large intestine is where that bacteria should be, not the small intestine, causes a lot of issues there. Okay, liver congestion, how are we doing on time? I think I'm doing pretty well given the amount of information. Yeah, we're doing pretty well. So liver congestion and detox disturbance, um, pretty big topic, we're gonna keep it pretty basic here. So this is an example, urinary bile acids, this is an indicator of liver toxic overload. And then down here, we actually see um, like beta glucuronidase is kind of another kind of indirect marker of potential detoxification issues in the gastrointestinal tract. It's an enzyme and we don't have time to get into that. So detoxification is a very extensive topic and involves a lot of biochemistry, but really it's, it's pretty simple. Um, if we just think about how many toxins are burdening your body and then how well your detox pathways are able to keep up with that demand. That's detox in a nutshell. It, it gets pretty complex, but you know, assessing for detox capacity uh, is very important. And then genetics have a, a big uh, impact on your ability to detox. Some people are great detox fires and others are not, uh, but detox strategies are, are crucial for any functional healing uh, process. So that's why we investigate it objectively with um, lab test data. Okay, oxidative stress. Uh, so like I said earlier, inflammation and oxidative stress are basically the two main plagues of the human metabolism. You know, inflammation, uh, rampant inflammation is, is really at the heart of like every disease, and then oxidative stress. So we have a couple indicators of oxidative stress, lipid peroxides, and then um, 8-OHDG, 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. Um, just different biomarkers. You guys don't need to worry about that. I just wanted to show an example of lab test data that, that measures uh, indicators of oxidative stress. So oxidative stress really comes down to free radical generation versus antioxidant neutralization of said free radicals and reactive oxygen species. Uh, so obviously we obtain antioxidants through the diet, like colorful fruits and veggies. But more importantly, the most powerful antioxidants are the ones that our body produces endogenously, like uh, glutathione, methylthionine, CoQ10, those are really what pull the most weight. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that will cause increased reactive oxygen species, such as thyroid issues. The thyroid is a free radical generating machine, but then it's a matter of can our antioxidant systems keep up with the free radicals being generated? Which actually, on that note, um, the easiest way, I wanna give you guys an analogy, the easiest way to think about oxidative stress, if you take a bite of an apple and you leave the apple sitting on the counter, it literally only takes a few minutes before the apple starts turning brown. And what's happening is the apple cells are starting to react with oxygen. It's starting to decompose basically. Obviously, if you leave that produce on the counter for you know a week, it's gonna, it's gonna decompose on the counter. Now the difference is uh, obviously if the apple was still connected to the apple tree and it's getting its life source, it's getting its nutrients, you know, maybe it could regenerate new cells and all that. So that's kind of thing with the human body. Our, our cells, our tissues are damaged by excess oxidation, but then the difference is we can produce new cells to replace those damaged cells, or we can use antioxidants to neutralize that quote unquote browning effect. Okay, environmental toxins and heavy metals, huge, absolutely huge. Um, for example, like the amounts of, um, uh, vaccines that are used today, and there's a lot of debate about vaccines, uh, but vaccines are a major source of heavy metals generally. Um, there was a, a series last summer, The Truth About Vaccines, that would be great if, if you guys want to learn more about that. Um, but also like dental amalgams, mercury from, you know, fish and everything, 
Um, uh, but not just mercury, you know, I don't want to get it overly focused on mercury, uh, but really like xenoestrogens in general, xenobiotics, heavy metal toxicity. So, you know, cosmetic, really just chemical manufacturing is absolutely insane. And, you know, we don't have time to get into all the details, but our environment has never been more toxic because in the past, I don't know, 50 years, you look at all the chemicals that are being produced. And guys, the thing is, you know, the FDA doesn't have to regulate, they don't regulate, uh, you know, these, these chemicals that are being produced and used in our products, in our goods and being sprayed on our foods and all of that. It's really pretty disturbing. And then actually the uh, WWF Living Planet report, this was a really disturbing, but also very enlightening report that basically showed that due to our toxic environment, we have reduced biodiversity in our environment by about 50% in the past 40 years. What does that really mean? It means we've killed off half of everything that lives on this planet in the past 40 years. That is mind blowing, but it makes sense though when you look at chemical manufacturing processes that really just started. I mean, think back to the you know early 1900s. We didn't have all these chemicals. We didn't have them. I'm not saying there weren't chemicals in the environment naturally, but we weren't. We didn't have chemists in the labs playing around with it and making all these volatile compounds that are very damaging to the human body, and then just throwing them out into the world for manufacturing process it's just crazy so this is an example actually of like a environmental pollutant panel where we can measure um different levels of toxic buildup there's too many chem there there is no lab test that can capture all of the chem there's too many there's too many chemicals but there are some different tests that can you know capture some of the main ones like xylene toluene etc et um, and then there's your metal testing heavy metal testing mercury testing so this is like a tri test, urine, hair, and blood. So we can see how well, well, first off, how much heavy metal burden is there in the body? The, how is it being excreted and stored and detoxified, all of that? How are we doing on time? Getting there, we're gonna run over, I warned you guys. Not too much though, we're, we're close to the end. Uh, viral infections. So viruses are, are interesting little buggers. You know, they contain DNA information they're, they're weird, they're like not living organisms, but they kind of are, they're creepy little things. Um, but viruses basically hijack your body, they're really creepy. So there's a lot of different types of viruses. Now, as you can see on my slide, you know, obviously read my notes. Um, I included an example, this is an Epstein-Barr virus. So Epstein-Barr virus is the virus that causes mononucleosis, right? Like mono, the, the kissing disease that basically most people get at some point in their life. Now, even if you never had mononucleosis, the vast, vast, vast majority of us do have the Epstein-Barr virus residing somewhere in our body. It does not mean it's an active infection, but it does mean the virus is there, it's somewhere. And that virus can be reactivated if your immune system is not working properly and your immune system will be depressed by other metabolic dysfunction that we've already talked about. Like I said earlier, high levels of cortisol suppress immune function, right? Or, you know, inflammation, all this, all this bad juju compromises the immune system. And then boom, a virus, you know, it's basically like not being held dormant anymore and it can reactivate. So EBV is, is huge, uh, for example, or cytomegalovirus. Here's an example of an aglase test, which really just measures, is there viral activity going on? Yes. Now we got to figure out, you know, how to deal with it. Um, now I will say though, the thing with viruses, you don't just like identify a virus and then go after the virus. You have to really take a holistic whole body approach. A lot of times I've seen this over and over. A lot of times if you work on the other metabolic systems and basically you improve the health of the host, the host will be able to subdue that virus on its own. So we don't want to be thinking of like, oh, I have this virus. What do I take to kill the virus? It's not really like that. It's how can I support my body's own immune defense so that my immune system can do its job and uh, suppress the virus itself. So that's where I like to look at like blood chemistry, looking at somebody's like lymphocytes in particular. Lymphocytes are really um, viral containing, subduing white blood cells. So, you know, if you go to your doctor and get your blood chemistry, um, have a functional practitioner interpret that from a functional perspective. I love doing that. Uh, so viruses, 
Okay, we're almost there. Lyme disease, which is Borrelia, uh, Borrelia bacteria. So Borrelia is the bacterial strain that causes Lyme disease, but Lyme disease is nasty stuff. Um, it really, some of the most complicated cases, you know, tend to be uh, Lyme disease, but, you know, we don't have time to get into all the, you know, things, but uh, Lyme disease can mimic a lot of, of really chronic conditions, whether it's mental illness or fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Um, and so then people are, are not sure what's going on. And it doesn't, it's not always obvious. Like if you were bitten by a tick and you have a bullseye rash, you better get yourself checked for Lyme. Um, but it's not always going to be obvious. Sometimes you're like, you know, in your doc, oh, I think you have fibromyalgia. Let's put you on, you know, different drugs for fibromyalgia. When in reality, you might have Lyme disease, you know. Uh, so Lyme disease is, is serious stuff and a very big hidden stressor. Uh, okay, well, second to last, we have biotoxins, mold, and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So I won't go too much into this, but I would say SIRS is one of the most complex uh, kind of conditions that functional practitioners can deal with. So chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is usually triggered by mold exposure. So like, you know, you have, you live in a moldy house and that's the thing, you might not even know you're being exposed to mold, but you know, this is biotoxin illness symptom cluster analysis. Um, we won't talk too much about it. Mar contest, multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staphylococcus. Ooh, that's a mouthful. But anyways, you know, mold can be a major trigger for metabolic dysfunction, a major hidden stressor. Um, fun fact, so I'm going out to San Diego. We have our Functional and Diagnostic Nutrition 10-year anniversary conference out in San Diego next week, and we're actually going to be doing a mold disease, uh, a mold illness conference because we, Functional and Diagnostic Nutrition, have been conducting our own uh, mold illness study for like the past six, eight, nine months, something like that. We are advancing the field and advancing our understanding of mold-related illnesses so that we can you know, advance the field and teach practitioners the best way to deal with this stuff. So very exciting uh, stuff. But anyways, uh, SIRS, very complicated. I have a couple clients with uh, mold issues and nasty stuff, very uh, crippling. Okay, finally, and then we're gonna wrap up, genetics. I saved this for last for a reason. So genetics is obviously, I mean, genetics really is kind of the future as we learn more and more about genetics. Um, you know, like who hasn't done a 23 and me test at this point in time, you know, and it's kind of fun. Like, Oh, I think your, your eye color is probably going to be blue, uh, based on your genetics. And it's like, well, yep, I got blue eyes. That's cool. Um, but nutrigenomics and epigenetics is a, uh, very rapidly expanding field within the functional industry. Um, and yes, you know, genetics are helpful and clinically relevant to some degree. Now, here's the thing. I do see a lot of confusion going on with genetics. Um, your genetic code is not as important as your epigenetic expression, which is gonna be controlled by environmental factors. So basically, regardless of what your genes are, what is your body currently doing? So genetic testing, we, 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 genetic testing is not part of our program per se. Now, yes, sometimes functional practitioners will use genetic testing. I at least wanted to touch on the fact that genetics do obviously play a pretty big role in your health. You know, some people are good at this or not good at this. You know, good detoxifiers, not good detoxifiers. This is a, uh, a picture of my genetic report. Now, not all genetic SNPs, that stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, not all genetic SNPs are clinically relevant. Some are, like everybody's kind of heard of the breast cancer gene, BR, BRCA, something like that. Um, most people have heard of that because, yes, it has been very well documented that people with that genetic mutation have a much higher risk of developing breast cancer. That has been very well proven, whereas there's a lot of other genetic SNPs that we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Um, so, for example, like MTHFR, that's a pretty major one. That is very well documented, very relevant, um, and very much will impact your biochemistry, specifically detoxification pathways, uh, neurotransmitter pathways, so on and so forth. So some genetic SNPs are relevant, uh, some are not. 
So, you know, I think that field needs a little bit more advancing, but there are some golden, uh, you know, pearls, golden nuggets in there, if you will. Um, but yes, genetics obviously do play a role in your resilience to metabolic dysfunction and therefore disease. Okay, boom. So, so let me kind of summarize this a little bit. As I mapped out there, again, we can't, even though hormones are great, because yes, I would say that hormones pull the most weight as far as why you feel the way you feel, why you look the way you look, why you perform the way you perform. Yes, I would say that hormones have the biggest control on that. However, as I hope I made abundantly clear, you can't focus on the hormones alone. If your hormones are messed up, you have to be thinking, why are they messed up? You know, oh, my testosterone's low, so let me just go start taking testosterone. That is not the answer, that's not the solution. It's not the right way to think about it. You're not gonna have the same level of health. We have to be thinking, what are the underlying causes that messed up your endocrine system? So that's the thing. In part one, I went deep into adrenal hormones, sex hormones, thyroid physiology, lots of lab test examples of that. Today was all about what's going on under the hood of your car. What different environmental factors or hidden sources of stress will provoke hormone imbalance. That's what it's all about. So that's where I mapped out everything that I mapped out today, whether it's digestive disturbance, mold exposure, viruses. These are the hidden stressors that functional practitioners specialize in identifying and dealing with, okay? So yes, let me reiterate, there's three categories of stress, biomechanical, structural, mental, emotional, and hidden stressors. All three have to be addressed if you want the level of health that you want and therefore the quality of life that you want. You have to deal with all three. Unfortunately, mental, emotional, and biomechanical are like the only things that people really know about. It's only functional practitioners and the nerds like us that study this other stuff. These are the hidden stressors. They're not obvious. They, they're lying deep within your body and you would never know they're there unless you had a functional practitioner do some lab work and identify them. So, okay, if you would like to be a functional ninja, a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, I mean, I, I don't know why you would be here if you're not semi-interested in that. Um, maybe you're interested in working with an FDN practitioner, maybe you're interested in becoming a practitioner. Uh, I can tell you, I, I just, I could not be more passionate about what I do. So yeah, you could say I'm biased, I guess, but not really, you know? I mean, I was just a, a kid obsessed with health and fitness, and you know, then here I am years later, and this is my whole life. Um, couldn't be more passionate about it. So, you know, the FDN certification program, it's no small undertaking, it's not. If you're looking for a career change, and you're looking for true answers, and you're looking to become one of the best functional practitioners in the world, you know, this program might be for you. It's kind of like, you don't just, you know, go out for the Navy SEALs, right? I mean, which I, I did, <laughs> that's that's the story. Um, before I got into the, the industry, I, I was in the Navy briefly, I, I won't get into that. But anyways, you don't just like, eh, I think I'll try becoming a Navy SEAL, that, that seems interesting. No, that's a huge undertaking. That's a huge, huge undertaking. Um, so is this, but if you're passionate about health and you want true answers, you want to be one of those people that like when your friend says, man, um, I just really don't feel good. And the doctors say everything's normal. They can't figure out what's wrong with me. You know, the people that are frustrated, the people that are chronically ill and they're hopeless and they're desperate for answers. If you want to be one of those people that can bring them light and bring them real solutions for their health struggles, this is for you guys. Like, I truly, truly mean that. Um, the most, I could not imagine doing anything else with my life. This is my passion. This is my calling. So this is, the program that's uh, all about that. So we do have a little bit of a promo going on, which man, I wish I had gotten this promo when I signed up, I, I paid my way. <laughs> uh, but we are doing a promo. If you sign up, which if you registered, you know, you are, you're in the loop on, you know, the emails and stuff. I'm not a tech person. I have my coworker, Catherine, um, running all of the uh, kind of logistical stuff. But if you sign up by the end of today, for the functional diagnostic nutrition course, you are going to get a advanced course and advanced course grammar for um, 
the urinary hormone course. So this is an advanced course. We have our functional diagnostic nutrition course that qualifies you to become a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. That's just the beginning though. There's no limit to how in depth you can get with it because then we have our advanced training courses. And if you sign up by the end of today, you get one Actually, of those. Actually, let me, let me jump in, Brendan. Actually, Ooh. that um, there is a link that will go out with the replay, oh. um, um, you know, tomorrow and okay. the form will be in there they actually have through the 19th to sign up for that and if oh. they do that then they can go ahead and get that course so, so, um, so they'll, have, they'll have that link to sign up starting tomorrow morning okay awesome so you guys heard it right there you have until the 19th then um that's awesome that's a bargain i'll tell you right now i've taken a lot of advanced courses the the stress and hormone course one of my absolute favorites like you want to become a wizard when it comes to navigating hormone imbalances that course is amazing now again that's an advanced course so really you're not going to be ready for that till you make it through the fdn course that's an advanced course but that's an amazing course one of my absolute favorites so the fact that you guys can get that as part of the regular sign up lucky ducks because i paid full price for that um but best money i've ever spent and it's Believe me, I've profited, you know, 10 times over uh, from doing this work. So, Catherine, thanks for uh, pointing that out. So, guys, that's pretty much all I have. That was a lot of info. I managed to, I'm proud of myself, only 10 minutes over. That was a lot of info to cover. So, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Again, Brent Vermeer with FDN here. A uh, lot of great info. But, again, if you want to change some serious lives in the best of ways and provide some serious health solutions that very few other professionals are able to, this is where it's at, the best of the best here. So look for that email, sign up if you're ready. Um, feel free to you know, ask questions. I'm always happy to chat with people and you know, give them the real scoop on here's what's up. So check that out, uh, keep posted for the email. We will be sending out the replay like Catherine said, you have till the 19th. Uh, but then of course, you, know, you can always sign up after that. You just won't get the advanced course uh, as part of your enrollment fee. But thank you guys again. A lot of great info. Thanks for tuning in. And I will see you guys next time. Much love, Star Children. Namaste.